Amanda from Street Smile Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about bite turbos or bite bumps. We're going to be talking about these because a lot of people are getting these with their braces and they're not understanding what they're for. So you can see here in the picture, these are some like handmade ones. These are made out of a composite material, which basically means it's composite is like a, um, it's not a ceramic, it's not like glass. It's basically like a plastic that can glue to your teeth. So it's not any different from a filling material. It's just that this is made blue so that we can identify where it is so that we make sure to, to remove it all. So sometimes you're going to have your bite bumps on your front teeth. Sometimes you're going to have them on your back teeth. They may be on the top. They may be on the bottom. You might even get them on your canines. It really depends on the personal preference of the doctor and maybe what they're trying to accomplish with them. So what are some of the reasons you might get bite bumps? Well, the number one reason that people put them on is to prevent patients from biting down on their bottom brackets. Now, not all patients have that problem where they might bite down on their bottom brackets, but some do if their bite is a little bit deep. And do take a look at some of my other YouTube videos to learn more about deep bites and how they're corrected. But that's the number one reason. Your doctor may be of the opinion that you shouldn't have these and instead that they'll just put the top braces on first and put the bottom ones on when it's time. So that is one opinion. There's really no wrong or right opinion um, and people have very strong opinions on this topic. So, you know, don't take it. You can always ask your doctor what they think is best. So what are some of the side effects from getting bite bumps on teeth? So it's important that you do understand the side effects because if you understand this, um, you'll be more aware of what's normal and what's not normal. So for top teeth, if you put them on the back of the front teeth, what's going to happen if you get these is that you're not going to be able to bite fully down anymore. That means your back teeth are not going to touch anymore for a period of time until you're done with these. This can make it very tricky to eat. So it's a double-edged sword. Number one, great. You got your bottom braces on. You're not breaking things anymore. That's wonderful. Number two, you can't eat things anymore very well. Soft things, yes. But, you know, like meat or something like that, you really can't chew things up very effectively more. So you're going to have to eat a pretty soft diet until your teeth start to match up again. These may be on six months to 12 months, you know, and over time, it will get better as your bite starts to change and accommodate for this. So it can be very rough initially, I won't lie. Number two, your front teeth might get very, very sore because you're putting more pressure on them. So you can take some Motrin to alleviate the discomfort. Again, as your bite will start to accommodate, this will start to go away. But it's you should be aware of the side effects so that you're not pretty shocked. And if you are, you know, first getting braces for the first time, you should or your child is, you should make sure you have lots of soft foods around the house, Jamba Juice, yogurt, stuff like that, um, that are easy to eat for patients, really, really soft food, you know, spaghetti, stuff like that. So what happens if you get these on your back teeth? Um, it's not quite as, you know, challenging to get used to. If you get them on your back teeth, you can still eat, but you can't bite with your front teeth in that case. So, you know, um, either way, it can be challenging. So in any case, I just wanted to explain a little bit more about bite bumps. If you have any questions, let me know. And today I want to talk to you about um, anterior bite turbos or just bite turbos. So there's posterior bite turbos, anterior bite turbos. You can look at my other videos, just type in bite turbo. Um, there's also anterior bite plates. I love anterior bite plates. But um, if you want a cheaper version of a bite plate, you can put on anterior bite turbos. You can custom make these. You just kind of stack them. But I've seen some really cool ones lately. And I'll be honest, when I was in practice, I never heard about this company, but it's mini mold, but I've been seeing some of my doctors have been using it with straight smile solutions and they make incredible bite turbos. They're just beautiful and um, easy to make, easy to put on. And this is a lot cheaper than buying um, bite plates. I mean, obviously, if you have a huge overjet, you're going to have to use a bite plate, right? Um, to level the curve of speed. But these are pretty sweet if you're in braces. So, um, you know, especially if they have all their teeth in. This is my kind of my go-to solution for any patient with a deep bite, but let alone a growing patient with a deep bite, especially a phase one patient with a deep bite. Here's an example right here of what's going on. So you can see there's a pretty significant deep bite. Of course, you like to verify it. Taking a Ceph is nice to verify the numbers as well, looking at it clinically. This is the model here. So what do we do, right? Now, most orthodontic treatment will help to level out the arches, especially if you get on the lower molars that will go ahead and help 
crack the deep by a little bit, but if you want a super fast correction, this is my go-to solution. Also, it has the added benefit of helping you get on the lower teeth sooner if you are doing phase two. So this is called a fixed bite plate. And again, this was a sample that was donated to me by Ohlendorf Laboratory. There are a lot of laboratories that do make this, but I will be co-producing our webinar with Ohlendorf, so I just wanna give them some props. But you can have this made in a variety of different colors and shapes. This is a clear acrylic that's made there, but I always recommend that you let the patient have fun with it. Pick a color, pick glitter, let them own their appliance. They're gonna be way more excited about it, okay? So basically the steps are that you're gonna go ahead and throw some spacers in the back molars initially, okay? So let's say this is your patient. You're gonna go ahead, throw some spacers in. Then I would take the scan or impression and send it off to the lab with the instructions, please fabricate anterior bite plate. And you, there's also fixed and removable versions. This is a fixed with bands, okay? If you're gonna be going on to doing brackets, you should ask for them to solder buckle tubes on there. If you're this is just phase one and you're not gonna be doing any braces, you're just doing bite correction, you don't need to have the tube solder on because that's usually a little extra money. Um, there's also a removable version. It looks like a retainer. Of course, that's gonna be compliance-based, so pick your patient wisely. So that's pretty much it. You send in the scan or impression. I usually recommend throwing the spaces in first and taking them out before you do that. That way they can fit the bands better. If you have bands in stock, you can fit your bands first, do a pickup impression, but this is a lot easier. Then you don't have to worry about stocking bands. It comes back to you like this. You go ahead and put your band glue in, thin layer. My favorite band glue is made by a 3M Unitech. It's called Band Lock, B-A-N-D-L-O-K. Um, comes in colors. So when you go ahead and load it and, and uh, allow it to light cure, it's going to change to clear from, I think it's purplish, purple blue. Um, but if the fit is not very tight, then I recommend using like a Fuji based modified um, glass ionomer because it's a little bit thicker. But I wouldn't use that unless you really need to because you're going to have a hard time getting it off. Okay. So yeah, you just like literally try it in first, make sure it fits. If it fits good, take it off. Um, having a band remover is helpful to take it off, but you don't have to have that. You know, you can just do it with cotton rolls and fingers too, if the, depending on the fit, right? Um, and then yeah, cement it. So cement it right on like this. Okay. And like cure it. And that's pretty much it. Let it cook. You, this should actually stay in, I would say a good minimum four months. I would like to see that in, if not longer. So let me show you what it looks like, the difference of what it looks like right? Super deep, right? You only see, I'd say it's about 60 to 70% deep bite. We see a little bit of the lower incisors, but not all. This is not a good deep bite. Now, those of you don't, that, don't know that much about overbites, this will get worse over time. It will not get better. You need to have confidence in telling your patients that, okay, as they grow. So it is a progressive disease. And over time, the lower teeth will start to touch the roof of the patient's mouth and cause frematis and periodontal destruction. So you must correct this. And the, er the younger the patient is, the better it corrects, okay? So now let's see what it looks like once we put the appliance in so you can see the difference. Holy cow, right? So if you had lower brackets on, whoo, you know, we don't even have to like put those kind of junk bite bumps on the back. Um, this will naturally allow the curve of speed to level out, whether you have braces or not. If you have braces on, it happens even faster because you can run some box elastics. I usually run my box elastics. So I'll run my box elastics, not in the initial wire, but I'll run them if you are doing braces, maybe once you get up to an 18 nine tie and I'll run them from molar, molar, canine, canine. So it's a box, okay? So three, six, six, three. If you're talking international numbers, that's on this side. That would be two, three, two, six, three, six, three, three, okay? I usually would use for box elastics, I'm gonna use quarter medium in an 18 nine tie, okay? And I'm gonna stay in that appliance and in the box elastics until the bite fully touches on the sides. And you can see right now, the bite is open, right? So until all the teeth are occluding, you can check with articulating paper, the appliance stays in, okay, on both sides. And if patients want to speed it up, they can wear their box elastics. Again, if this is phase one, you don't have, you know, brackets on all the teeth, no need, just let it settle on its own, right? And you can also build an anterior bite plate um, into removable appliances like Schwartz's, like sagittals, and all kinds of other things. 
that you want to do it. So you can really kind of bling them out. It's really cool. Kill two birds with one stone. Um, really awesome in a phase one case. And we're going to be teaching you more about that in our seminar on November 5th. So we hope to see you there. But And you can even modify the bite plate to make it incline, which kind of makes it act more like a class two appliance. So, wow, I know that was a lot of information. So I do recommend that you connect with us to learn more at straightsmilesolutions.com. And we will tell you more about how to use a bite plate. Adjusting your fixed bite plate. And this is an example of a fixed bite plate here. You can see there's acrylic right here, right? This one's good because it was made with rests. So you really probably shouldn't need to adjust one. But if you get one that isn't made with rests, then you might have to adjust it. Sometimes they can be bouncy when you push on them. So one of the first things I do, and just keep in mind whenever you deliver a bite paint plate is when you, if you decide you need to adjust the acrylic, especially if new teeth are coming in, you might want to use some articulating paper just to check it. And you don't want to adjust the acrylic in any place where the lower teeth are hitting. So that's really important because that kind of takes away the whole concept of the bite plate. But let's say you had new teeth coming in here or here, then you could always adjust the acrylic here. And it's actually a great idea also with bite plates it is to adjust it right here. If you're trying to close a diastema or something like that, that's totally fine to get out your acrylic burr and make some adjustment right here. Just don't adjust it here. And just remember, whenever you're delivering a bite plate, there's going to be an adjustment phase where the patient's not going to have occlusion on the back teeth. They're only going to have occlusion right here, right? So it's going to change how you can eat. Think about this. If you could only chew your food on your front teeth and not your back teeth, it totally kind of freaks people out a little bit. So you need your patient to be prepared for what life is going to be like with the bite plate when they go home. They need to have a lot of soft foods. Um, jamba juice, mashed potatoes, pasta, things that can basically be gummed like a baby, you know, for six months, I'm sorry, six months, six to eight weeks at least until you start to get more occlusion on the back teeth. A lot of times parents are going to freak out about that. You know, they need to be ready for this. So I just want you to be mentally prepared for what you need to tell your patient. But again, if you needed to adjust your bite plate, this is my go-to instrument, which is the three-prong plier. I'll usually give it a quick squeeze right here, okay? And then right here, just to seat it a little bit more. And just a tiny little squeeze while it's in does wonders. That's all you need to do. If you squeeze too much, you're gonna break the seal on the bands and it's gonna pop out and you're gonna have to undo it and do it again. That initially only Invisalign offered but now um, you can get this in white label as well. So you can see um, we're starting off with multiple missing teeth, um, almost 100% deep bite. We have a cross bite here. Um, obviously we have a lot of spacing. The goal is to upright the molar so that you can place some implants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do have a cross bite on the left. Um, the decision has been made not to correct that cross bite because it's probably not a stable movement. Um, just to leave that as is. This is going to be a compromise outcome. Um, the amount of steps is, as you can see, I think 25. So we're going to go ahead and play it now. If I can find the play button. Okay, here we go. And the bite ramps are working really good. They're leveling the curve of speed. Midlines are on. We're leaving the cross bite on that side. Bite ramps. I use bite ramps on any patient that has a deep bite and or any patient that shows um, evidence of parafunction, bruxism, um, clenching. I find that these ones, if they are having parafunction, um, nocturnal parafunction, that they will actually cause intrusion of their posterior teeth with the plastic. They actually push it down. It causes a force. And then you end up with this posterior open bite. And almost every doctor that's done Invisalign has had a bunch of these cases. It's I have a great video on how to deal with it. Um, it's a separate video. Feel free to ping me if you're interested. But by putting bite ramps on either a parafunction case or on a deep bite case, it helps to helps not only with a bite, but help to prevent posterior open bite. So that's what that's for. Hey, this is Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today we're going to talk about putting on posterior bite bumps. Um, how do we do that? Why do we do that? 
and what's the easiest way to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you. So posterior bite bumps are basically little globs of bumps, of glue, of composite, that you put on back teeth temporarily in orthodontic cases to help keep patients from breaking brackets. Um, and or, like in this situation here, see how number seven and 10, or the upper twos are in crossbite? Um, they won't likely jump forward as easily once you get brackets on them and engage them because they're tucked behind the lower laterals. So if you raise the bite a tiny bit, like this, um, then they're much like more likely, you know, cause even though we're in a resting position, mostly during the day at nighttime, often we're like this, right? So that's like, and when we're stressed, we're like this. So that's like half your day that they won't be able to move if you're locked in like that. So it just makes things move quicker and easier. Now, remember, you don't want to necessarily put posterior bite bumps on all your patients, because if you leave them on too long, the tooth, teeth that you put them on actually can intrude over time and the teeth. So we don't want to do that. Right. So we only want them on as short as possible and we wanna make sure we take them off. The reason why I don't like them when they're done clear or white or tooth colored is that you forget they're on. They kind of quasi start to wear down. They look just like a lumpy filling and you forget, right? And then later at the end of treatment, the patient's like, aren't you gonna take this off? And now those teeth are intruded. And now you gotta spend another four months in braces trying to upright them. So that's why I like to color them. So I'm gonna show you how I do it. There are a couple different ways to do it. So let's pretend like we're putting bite bumps on this patient. We're only gonna leave them on as short as possible, maybe only one or two months, and we're gonna color them so we know to remember to take them off. Um, so this is how I do it. I go ahead, I make my two little blobs of glue, express it out, one. Or you can just do one big one and split it in half, either way, two. Okay, this is my little trick. I take a piece of articulating paper. I like the blue side, not the red side, because red side looks like blood, blue side looks like blue. And I put a, just a drop of primer on the articulating paper with the micro brush and I mix it around and see how my micro brush is now blue. It's really easy. And then I use that to mix the composite. It's just a really subtle blue, okay? Mix it up. Mix it all around. Now here's the thing is I don't etch and prime the molar when I do this because I don't really care if it falls off. Matter of fact, I want it to fall off. It makes my life a heck of a lot easier if it does, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and roll it around, okay? You can even just dot it in here if you want. That's another way to do it when you roll it around. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just put it with the micro brush on the tooth. It doesn't matter if you do top, bottom, whatever tooth is easier. Obviously, if it's on a mixed dentition case, I would prefer to do it on a baby tooth than a permanent tooth, because that way it can fall off and I don't have to worry about it. But usually I'll do it on premolars or molars. You need to make sure it does not um, you need to make sure it does not go in between the contacts or anything. You also want to put it where they're biting. So it's a good idea to like have the patient tap, 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 grind around, make sure you find the spot where they're biting, you know, all extrusive movements and everything. So if possible, you're going to do that and make sure you do it bilaterally because goodness, of course, this patient's like biting all kind of random spots, but anyways, maybe I'll put it like right there. Okay, and then that's pretty much it. I just put it on. Sometimes I'll have them lightly tap down. Oopsies, let's not do that. It's a little different on a type of dot than on a real patient. And then I just go ahead and light cure. And that's that. And of course, there we go. And you're gonna have to do a lot of light curing because normally, of course, you're putting these on in layers, you know, so it'll stay on for a few months. And like I said, if not, you remember it's blue and you'll remember to take it off, okay? So we gotta do that bilaterally. So I have two of these here. I might as well do this correctly. Go ahead and do my other one. What happened to my articulating paper? Here we go, lost it. So yeah, I don't do red because red looks like blood and patients freak out with that. Um, and that way, 
I remember to take them off if they're blue. Just kind of turn it blue. It's a little messy. All righty. Now let's go ahead and light cure this sucker. I'm going to pause this for a second while I finish light curing, and then we'll show you. All right, we're done light curing. Let's see if this did the trick. And now you say, yes, it's probably a little bit overdone, which you're going to find happens, which is okay. Um, honestly, they're probably going to fall off anyways. If not, I'm going to take them down. They're going to wear them down. So this is okay. This is not something super crazy. This will definitely do the trick. And if it doesn't come off as soon as these jumps crossbite, I'm going to go ahead and drill them off. Remember, they're blue, so they're really easy to notice that they're there. Um, you won't forget to take them off at the end. You'll make sure you get it all off too, you know, which patients appreciate. And that's the trick of bite turbos, posterior bite turbos. And if you want to do anterior bite turbos, that's okay too. That's for something different. I tend to do anterior bite turbos either on the backs of the canines or the backs of the front teeth. Um, you can buy actually a mold for those, which makes them a really nice shape. Um, if you want to, or you can just do the style that I just did. Of course, you want to check your bite first. That is meant for deep bites where you want to open the bite and level the curve of speed with elastics, like um, triangle elastics or posterior box elastics. And you can just put it right back here if you have occlusion. Again, as always, check your occlusion. That's an alternative to a fixed bite plate, which I actually like better. Those are palate supported. Um, I think it's healthier. My concern always doing the anterior bite turbos is that it can cause some fremitus, um, so widening of the PDLs. You definitely want to pick your patients wisely because you don't want to pick somebody with short roots who's already maybe had some trauma to the front teeth, but is definitely an option. Um, but the posterior bite bumps, like I said, are short term to clear anterior crossbite or posterior crossbite to lift the occlusion um, and or to deal to reduce the likelihood that you're breaking lower brackets during treatment. But Try not to keep them on any more than two months, which is why we're coloring them blue. And by the way, if you don't have articulating paper, which I think you probably do, another way you can do this is with one of those denture um, pokey sticks. You know, those ones, if you, if you see prost patients, you use those little like blue sticks to, to tap a denture sore spot. You can use that as well. That works just as well as the articulating trip. All right. Hope that helped. Thanks so much.